In this video, I'll be introducing partitions and unity on general topological spaces. In the last one, we just did it on smooth manifolds, and uh, we said it was basically a collection of maps, psi alpha for alpha and j, and some uh, open sets u alpha for alpha and j. And they had some properties, but the fundamental idea was that it was a smooth map from your smooth manifold down to the real numbers. Well, let's keep all of the properties that we had, except let's change the fact that it's a smooth map from your smooth manifold down to the real numbers to that it's a continuous map from a topological space down to the real numbers. It still has the property that it's between 0 and 1, that the sums all go to 1. It's just that it's now a continuous map and not a smooth one. And so that's the partition of unity on a general topological space. Now this is the theorem that we're eventually going to want to prove. And it's that for any normal space, if you don't know what a normal space is, it'll be in the I card up there when I make the video. At the time of this being uploaded, it's not a video yet. But when I make it, you'll see what a normal space is. So for any normal space X and any finite open cover, let's call it UI from I equals 1 to N. So for any open cover of this normal space, there exists a partition of unity subordinate to it. And that's the theorem we're going to prove. However, what we're going to need is a much stronger, I guess, a uh, much more general theorem, and it's actually called a lemma, and it's the Urysohn lemma. And what the Urysohn lemma says is that if I have a normal space X, and then two closed disjoint, so they, their intersection is empty, and they're closed subsets, so their complements are open, Two closed disjoint uh, subsets A and B of X, then there exists a continuous function F from X down to 0, 1, such that F of A is 0. So the for every point in A, the F of A is 0. And then F of B is 1. So every point in B goes to 1. That's the Uri sum lemma. This is actually one of the most um, important lemmas in topology. I don't have a video on it, but I will make one, and it'll be I card up there. Anyway, we're going to use this lemma along with another lemma, which says that x is normal if and only if for every closed a, a subset of X, and open U, which contains A, there exists an open V, a subset of X, such that A is a subset of V, and V closure is a subset of U. So if we have A, right here, and we have U, then we can find V that contains A, and also if you put back in its boundary, then it will also be contained in U. This, these are two equivalent definitions. Now I'm also going to use one more important lemma, although it isn't nearly as important as these other two. Now this other lemma, which I'll call just lemma four, basically just says that if I'm given a finite cover, if given a finite open cover of some normal space X, then there exists a new cover, which I'll call VI for I equals 1 to N, such that uh, VI bar is a subset of UI. Basically, we can create a refinement that is even better than a refinement because VI closure is a subset and not just VI. And so it's still a cover, 
but you we've reduced it a really good amount. Now the instance when we use lemma 3 is to prove lemma 4. All right, that's the only time we use it. And so now this one is actually very easy to prove, and so I'll just skip over the proof of it. In case you're wondering how to prove this one, I'll leave it in the notes down below. These three lemmas right here are the requirements for us to prove this one right here. And so the proof of uh, theorem one goes like this. Basically, we start off with our finite cover, and then we apply lemma four to create this new cover, vi, from i equals 1 to n, such that vi bar is a subset of ui. And then we use lemma 4 again to create a new open cover, wi, from i equals 1 to n, such that wi bar is a subset of vi. Let me draw out a picture. So we have right here ui, and then in here we have vi, and then in here we have w. I. And in each of these instances, when I close them, all of this order is kept. And the important part about this is that this maintains the open cover status. All right, it keeps it being an open cover. And now we have these this chain. And then what I'll use is the Urysohn lemma. And I'll use the Urysohn lemma on wi bar and x removing vi. Clearly, both of these are closed. That's a closure, of course. That's the complement of an open set. So we, both of these are closed, and they're disjoint because wi bar is a subset of vi. And so if I do the complement, then they're disjoint. And then we can create a new function, ci, that goes between x and 0, 1 such that psi i of w i bar is 1 and psi i of x removing v i is 0. Now the reason why I'd want to do this is for the supports. This will always be equal to 0 and the support works when we're setting it equal to 0. And so if I do the support of psi i, by this fact right here, this must be a subset of v i bar, all right? Because remember, this is the this would be the set where phi i of x is non-zero, and then I close it, and then this one has it where phi i of the complement is zero. And so, and so vi would have to contain the set where it's not zero, and therefore vi bar would contain the support. And then, by this property right here, this is a subset of ui. Oh, well, isn't that nice? The support of psi i is a subset of ui, and so it's subordinate as long as it's actually a partition of unity. And uh, we use the exact same trick that we did last time. So we define a new capital Psi of X function, which is the sum from I equals 1 to N of Psi I of X. All right, now this is always going to be positive due to the fact that WI is an open cover of the entire space and it's equal to 1. So Psi of WI is 1, and so one of these is always going to have to be 1. So it's always going to be positive, and therefore what I can just go ahead and do is I can define phi i of x to be psi i of x divided by this sum of all of them, capital psi of x. And then we get a partition of unity right here, and due to the fact that this is positive, this is maintained. The support's the same, and that's the trick that we used last time, and that's how you prove it. These phi i's is the partition of unity subordinate to ui. And uh, now this wouldn't really be a good manifold video unless I bring manifolds into it. And so the last theorem, theorem 5, is that every 
compact manifold can be embedded into some Rn for some n. It's not necessarily the dimension of the manifold, and in fact, most of the time it isn't the dimension of the manifold. For example, the torus, although it's two-dimensional, it can only be embedded into R3, and the climb bottle, despite being two-dimensional, is only embeddable into R4. Now, notice that I did not say smooth manifold. This is just normal manifolds, but they have to be compact for it to work. So first of all, let's choose a bunch of charts, uh, U alpha, phi alpha, for alpha in J, uh, of your manifold M. I'll just give it a name now. And um, let's give it a dimension lowercase n. Now specifically, these must cover M. So these U alphas cover M. Well then by the fact that M is compact, that means that we can reduce this to a chart, uh, some charts UI, vi from i equals 1 to n. Every open cover has a finite sub cover. Uh, remember that this is an embedding from phi i from ui down to r capital uh, r lowercase n. So this is an embedding. Remember that. And then the next part is that because it's compact and because manifolds are Hausdorff, that means every compact Hausdorff space is normal. So M is normal. And then we'll create a partition of unity subordinate to these UIs. And so we'll have UI y equals 1 to N. Using this one and the fact that it's normal, we create the partition of unity subordinate to it. Psi I from I equals 1 to N. And then what we'll do is we'll let A equal to the support, um, sorry, AI equal to the support of psi I. And then we'll define a function HI of X, which is going to be equal to, well, psi I of X times the phi I of X, as long as X is an element of ui. And then it's going to be zero, the zero vector, uh, as long as x is an element of the manifold removing ai. But the important part is that we can use the gluing lemma because we have the ui and the m removing ai and because they, they agree on the overlaps. If we have it that they're not in ai, that means that one of them has to be zero. That means that phi i has to be zero because the supremum is when it's not zero. So when it's not in ai, it's zero. Therefore, when we multiply these two get it together, we get zero. They align on their overlap. It's just the gluing lemma. Now this one isn't actually going to be the embedding. The one that's going to be the embedding is, I am so sorry. I should give the manifold a different dimension. I should call it M. So the manifold has dimension M, not N. And the reason why I did this was because I gave this one the index N. Now the actual embedding is going to be from the manifold into R to the power of M plus one N. And the way I'll do it is say F of X is just going to be psi 1 of x all the way up until psi n of x and I'll go from h 1 of x all the way up until h n of x. And so these ones bring you down to r and so there's n, n of them right there. So this one is n. Each of these bring you to r m, the dimension of the manifold due to the fact that we're taking in values from the manifold and using the, the charts. And so this one is m times n. And so I get m plus 1 times n as the dimension. And this is actually very suboptimal. It's very suboptimal. We could make it much better, but this is just a nice simple proof. So this is the embedding from m down to some 
R N. And so basically what you should get out of this is that partitions of unity, not only are they useful on smooth manifolds, they're useful on topological spaces, and they're also useful just for normal manifolds. Although we had to make them compact and had to make it very suboptimal. But you know, it's still pretty good. And that's it. Sorry for the lack of video, guys. I'm just busy. I'm busy, alright?